this conversation, you guys missed it, but it started out pearl snaps and the, the just more pros to the list of pearl snap shirts. So, hate you guys missed that. Maybe we'll fill you in at some point. But it is July Six. 6th. So, happy belated Independence Day. Yeah. Uh, oh, today, so today's the 6th. I just wanted to give a shout out to our friend Catherine Raven, who mm -hmm. came on the yep. podcast three episodes ago uh, about her book Fox and I, which releases today. I've got three copies ordered, and they're going to be, I'm going to go pick them up from the local bookstore here probably today or tomorrow, whenever they call me. But uh, Fox and I is the book, and you can go pick it up and call your local bookstore. But if you haven't listened to that episode. Yeah, go back and check out Dr. Catherine Raven. She's a. Uh, She's super interesting. Super, super cool. Super cool individual. As a matter great, of fact, great when, story. We, when we finished that podcast, Cody's like, hang on for a minute, and called her. Uh, yeah, we were still on the phone with her, and he's like, hey, do you want to come do our Habitat Summit? Like, you are welcome anytime to North Carolina. She was that cool. I mean, she's she's legit. Yeah, we're, we're planning a deer hunting trip together. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, kind of. Like, it's a little bit of a joke, but kind of. Yeah. We're talking about doing some hunting, so she was super cool. I, I, I dug the episode. It was, uh, what I liked about her was that she, um, she had a, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling for words, but there was a little, there's a little hippie in there, which I, I dig, but also, man, she was really practical, very practical, yeah. yeah, you know, and so you don't find that combination a lot. When you do, I think it's a, it takes a special person to be able to, to kind of hold, hold those, both those kind of separate, yeah, they're, they're hard to find, yeah, they're they hard people to find. So she was super cool. So, yeah, check out her book, it just dropped, yeah, today. Secondly, uh, while we're BSing before we get into the meat, you got a new boat. I am the owner of a new vessel. Yeah. A new vessel. Traded my old boat. Upgraded. Some some would say upgraded. I know I know that you want to be kind of on the DL, not to hurt the guy's feelings. But are you willing I doubt to, he listens. Okay. You got a screaming deal. Go go. Uh, uh, it was a good deal. Definitely, definitely it was a good deal for both of us. Okay. because um, neither one of us were out of out of a boat and of course his my contribution came with cash. I mean, of course. So um we both got what we needed, and neither one of us had to stop fishing to get a new boat. So that was the that was the best part of the deal. But um, yeah, the first night, I owned it less than 24 hours. First night out, I caught one of the biggest fish of my life out of that boat. So, so man, it, what is the biggest? What it would have been? It would have been the biggest fish had he. I pulled him out of some deep water, like like 38 feet of water, and when I got him on the deck of the boat, he ex he expelled. A bunch of water out of his vent, um, just you know, from coming out of all that pressure. And about two gallons came out. I mean, a lot of water. I mean, a lot of water, and you know, stomach content and stuff. And uh, I weighed him after that, and he weighed fifty-two Holy point eight pounds. Smokes. So had he held that water, and you just figure a gallon of water is eight pounds, it'd have been significantly over sixty. And it would have been my biggest fish on my whole boat was 55 of a blue cat. So he would have been he would have been there. Well, congrats. So I was I was stoked about it. So it's off to a good start. Off to a good start with that boat. But I've been coming up. The reason Sam brings this up, I've been spitballing names sure. for the for the new boat. You gotta you know you gotta break break a bottle of champagne over the bow and, and name it. Um, I don't know if it applies so much to used boats as it does new boats, but. <laughs> For me, if it's new to me, I feel like it applies and you need to go through all the traditions so you don't have a jinx boat. You know, you can't. I, I'm a little superstitious, not super into it, but I've been coming up with names. So here's what I got so far. So I'm looking for a maritime, maritime play on words a little bit, something funny, but still cool. And the first one I had was um, not my problem, spelled K N O T. Not my problem, which I thought was kind of cool. And then is this uh, the kind of boat that can take graphics? Oh yeah, we're gonna yeah. It's, oh wow. Yeah, I can do whatever I want to it. Wow. Yeah, we're gonna it's gonna get logo for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I may wrap my pickup. <laughs> I may wrap my house. Uh, everything I'm gonna do from here on out is gonna revolve around this boat. Um, but uh, to, to backstory, this is the boat that I've been saving since I was ten years old to get. Oh. Like this is the boat that I've always wanted pretty much exactly what I always wanted. And it kind of fell into my lap. I, I, Over, I, I, overnight. I'm dying. So, so it's a 20 foot, it's a 20 foot Sea Arc. Oh, nice. Um, with a nice. 115 on it. Um, Suzuki 115, it's only a couple years old. It's in great shape. It's 
So that's Where's the, the console? Center console. Nice. Center console. Um, Going to do some upgrades here and there, but this is the that's a boat. That's a seaworthy vessel. It's and it's big. It's yeah. a big. Boat. Yeah. I, the sea arc is about as good a new aluminum boat as, as you. you as yeah. It's as tough as you can get. Yeah. And you had a get. seventeen footer prior, mm -hmm. and it's amazing what three foot get you in okay. terms of space. Because well, I can tell you, day. That my fourteen forty eight eighty two Alumacraft riveted getting pushed by my two smoke. 25 uh, is not an upgrade mm -hmm. from what you're talking about. Yeah. So. It's a big difference. It's just, a, <laughs> just totally different categories of boats, man. So your capacity on your old boat, your 17 footer was four. Four people. And then or the, wherever the weight yeah, equivalent is for normal size people. The 20 is 11? 11, mm -hmm. yeah, 11 people. That's awesome. Isn't that wild? Huge. It's huge. A lot of room. I put a, one of those uh, nautical bean bags on it, you know, the mm -hmm. boat bag. Um, so I got some cushy seating, like, I'm, I'm, I'm turning into a super, like, lazy fisherman, I guess. Like, I have all name. the comforts and amenities. I have a name suggestion. Well, let me tell you the other one I have. Go ahead. So, not my problems, one. Yeah. Um, the other one was Naughty Girl, spelled N-A-U-T-I. Oh. Because um, I thought that was kind of funny. That's very naughty. Mikey, Mikey's also, Mikey <laughs> also, also she's, like, she's like, if you were a bachelor, that'd be a great name for a boat. <laughs> so I was like, well, I mean, okay. So what was your suggestion? Just something catchy and like that, you know, fits you, I think would just be, um, I'm a better fisherman than you, semicolon, get out of my way. And just have that. <laughs> That's a cool name for a boat slash hashtag. Or just something. No, like just that. all the way across. Just all the way around the boat. <laughs> yeah. Wrap my truck with the same. I'm better. <laughs> sure. Um, but there's one. A little great. long, but good. So, Grayson, you'll like this one. I know you'll like this one. And this is where Mikey's following in. Because it's our boat, it's not just mine. Sure. Um, whisker bin instead of whiskey bin. Whisker bin. That's cool. I mean, it's a cool name for a catfishing boat. That's very cool. So, cool name for a catfishing boat. Um, that's kind of where we're following right now. Uh, I look forward to the write-ins on this. If you have any, yeah, if you have any <laughs> suggestions or write-ins, please send them on in. Where are you? And where are you at with the fancy electronics? Uh, I'm not. I'm not with the current times. I can tell you that. Um, no, I don't have live scope. Um, you can go back and listen to the episode where we talk about that kind of thing. But I've got a. It was about the same as what I had on my other boat. Um, this is a bigger screen, but it's a low ranks um, hook too. A 12 inch screen, so it's like a TV. So you're still fishing? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we're fishing. Yeah, I'm still fishing. We're not video gaming. I'm not video gaming yet, but I would like to be. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm all for it. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, I would love to have a live scope, but that's expensive. That's, that's worth more than the boat. <laughs> anyways, so, anyways, yeah, let's talk. Uh, we're not here to talk about boats today. We're here to talk about dogs and guns and bird hunting and companions, companions and buddies and. All the things, so introductions, Sam and me, of course, and then I'm sure you've listened to the episodes because they're two of the most popular episodes we've ever put out. Um, we've got Grayson Geyer of Lost Highway Gun Dog Kennels, but episode titled Lost Highway Gun Dog Kennels mm -hmm. is the episode where we interviewed Grayson himself. I was listening to Lost Highway, getting ready this morning on the drive in. <laughs> And Emily Shirey yeah. from Short Hairs and Shotguns as well. Um, so and, and yeah, the number one downloaded episode that we have. So I'm sure you've listened to it. And if you haven't, then you, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Emily's here uh, as well. So they, the reason they're together is actually we met Grayson kind of through the podcast, really, um, and uh, then got to be friends. And then Grayson introduced us to Emily, and so that's how we all kind of came together we're now all big buddies and we all like bird dogs and everything that goes with it that's right and not just bird dogs all dogs but mm -hmm. we're here talking about bird dogs so so yeah at, before we get into like our discussion about bird dogs and and talk with them again we have an hour and a half to talk about what we're going to talk about more or less more or less no telling where we'll go but uh these two have a podcast together the companion gun dog podcast and if you want deep dives, one thing that I really like about y'all's show is, uh, and your personalities, is all your experience and everything that you talk about, you're very open about the people that have led you to, and the philosophers and the, um, the behaviorists, and you source everything really well. And I think it's like, I admire the kind of person that says, this is what I think, but it's not, I'm not some genius who came up with this. 
it's I've learned this through experience and through reading and these people before me were the ones who kind of came up with this idea and I'm just molding a methodology based on previous people's accomplishments. And, you know, they're very open about that and I think it takes an intelligent and wise person to, to cite the people that you learn from. So every episode they talk definitions, they um, have show notes. The show notes are yeah, I mean, it's you're doing too much work, man. <laughs> My show notes are like, check this episode out. <laughs> Thanks for our sponsors. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know, it, it, it's uh, I think I think I came it I came to that from a couple of different directions. First and foremost, when when we started talking about it, you know, Emily, I've been a big podcast listener. I like. The, the big ones, you know, the ones that are only on Spotify now. Mm -hmm. um, I like, uh, I really enjoy you guys. And so, I, you know, I can, I, I spend a lot of my day with earbuds in because I spend a lot of my day either alone or just with dogs and a lot of it's just choring. So like a lot of dog training is, is uh, okay. just getting your setups right, you know, getting everything together and then you know, the, the work, it's a lot of prep work, right? Yeah, so, for 15 minutes of... Yeah, training a dog. Right? Training, <laughs> training, tra training 10 or 15 mm -hmm. dogs at a time. And, and then the rest of it's cleaning candles and everything else. So, so so much of my day spent with your buds in. I really like podcasts. And so um, I kind of knew I wanted to figure out how to produce some content in that way because I thought there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot of stories to tell. And then when I, when I started talking to Emily, she she concurred and she supported the idea and I wanted to make sure she was involved because um, my life has just been, my work life has been much more organized since she's been around. She's good at that and she keeps me on track and I tend to ramble and I tend to do that in everything else I do. So, so having Emily around has been, uh, been a real blessing for me in, in more ways than one. Um, but she told me that she really did not care for chatty podcasts. They were just a, just a hang session you know and, okay. and so um and we listened to a couple that were more of a like a soliloquy style podcast that were like i like the history just some history podcast and stuff like that and then uh, there's another dog trainer out there named jerry bradshaw that does a really mm -hmm. good one um, that i've sent people to a lot and he just sits down and does a lesson essentially every time and so we kind of modeled it on that and i think there's i think people like it because it's gotten a lot of traction um, yep. and the idea is let's just go out there and let's you know, people, there's, if they want, they like me, if they like to enjoy a conversation, there's a lot of options for them. Yeah. Now, the hunting and fishing landscape and was yeah. not missing another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a, that, that, Sam and I talk about that, we talk about that a lot. Yeah. Like, yeah. There, it's, if you think it hasn't been done, it's been done. That's right. And it's been done four or five times by four or five people that are probably better than you at it. I mean, yeah. And I knew that. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It wasn't missing, but the way you guys have formatted it is different. And uh, it's it's not only entertaining, but it's extremely educational. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I like about it. I like that a lot. And I also like, there are a lot of hunting dog I'm using air quotes here. I know you can't see me, but there are a lot of hunting dogs. You can't can can see. Oh yeah, we are. Yeah, I guess we're filming. Sorry. That's new. We're we're getting. North used Carolina to is a one uh, one party consent state on film. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you guys have already taken care of that for yeah, us. <laughs> apparently, Addy did the consenting for us. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, just letting you know, there a little legal legal background on that. Um, <laughs> and recording, by the way. So all filming and recording is one. One party state back to uh, the thing. So, with uh, hunting dog podcast, now that you can see me, hunting dog podcast, there are a lot of them that I feel do not deserve the title to even include anything about gun dogs or hunting dogs in their thing. They spend time talking about crap that doesn't apply. A lot of time talking about things that are not into it. And I'll, if you're going to title your podcast something to do with hunting dogs, it better talk about hunting dogs, yeah. and a lot. Yeah. Um, and you better know more than just the dog you like. Yeah. Like You better know more than just a lab. Yeah. Because not everybody has labs. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has wire hairs. Not everybody has Boykin. And uh, so that I like that your podcast applies to a big spectrum of hunting dogs. And that's, and that's cool. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, I, I know yeah, so much of my work is made up of hunting dogs. And, it, and when you're a dog trainer, you kind of got, like I, I love training retrievers. I mean, I love it. Um, 
it's like the podcast scene there. There ain't no shortage of retriever trainers, uh, especially right. in North Carolina, South Carolina. Oh, we're, we're in the capital of the world. Yeah. And there's some great ones. And I, and I felt like, you know, the place I had to offer, there, and there's still a lot of enthusiasts and pointing dogs, and I just felt like I had more to offer in that scene. But at the same time, I take the occasional retriever, I take the occasional flusher, I still like keeping them around. I got two, I got eight. This is going down a rabbit hole, but I got a field spaniel, which is a completely separate breed. Mm -hmm. um, long tail? It, it docked up to like three quarters. Okay. Um, long, left longer. He's just a different looking dog, but he's turned out to be pretty nice, and I've got a cocker in right now. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah and a really nice little. Getting dog. rare in the hunting dog scene, I feel like. It's, they're in to some degree. It depends on what scenes you're running with, but there's a, there's a contingent in like southwest Georgia. That really Still sticking with it. lots of cockers down there. And I mean, like, it's just there's a real scene down there. So the bird dog scene that mm -hmm. is, is big down there, and they still run pointer and setter trials a lot and horseback stuff. And that those crowds were, if you want to go hunt some of that property on wild birds in Southwest Georgia, you better bring a lot of money. Um, they they've got they've still got a nice healthy population of cockers that they they breed lines off of, and then it's gotten really popular lately really, to bring some in from. From the UK as well, mm -hmm. so they're 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 in their space. They're they're gaining steam. Um, but There's a lot of um, guides who use cockers with their pointing dogs yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that a lot. I, I still perform prefer my labs for that simply because. You like, used to be a have a cocker. I, know, I had a cocker. I had a cocker. She was great, and I sold her off to a plane. My, what I used to do is start them, and I'd get them to where they were working well for me. I'd sell them off to a plantation. Mm -hmm. I'd start with them. I just enjoy. And, I, and was, when I say sell them off to a plantation, it wasn't willy nilly. It was, I want to make sure they were going on to the right place, they're going to work hard and have a good home. Um, you know, but that's, uh, I, I do enjoy starting dogs. And I started Althea, my lab, which is. is uh, With the plan of uh, her. Doing the same deal, right? I'm going to start her off and we'll get her right and then we'll move her down the line and she ain't going nowhere, man. So, <laughs> what, uh, so what happened? What was the special? I know we're. This is, this is the exact kind of thing I want to talk about. Like, 100%. So, okay. join it. so for background, that's the mother of Sally. Of your puppy. Sally, Sally. So what happened with Althea? Like, why the change of heart? It had been a while. so freaking cool. <laughs> yeah, it had been a while since I'd had my own lab. I'd, I'd had a few through doing the same thing. So starting them, and, and if they had certain attributes, they may make a bomb dog. And, and uh, you know, for, for transparency and clarity, like a bomb dog, if I get them to a year of age, is going to sell at a year old, depending on where the market is, for more than a starting gun dog. Oh yeah. Right. It's just if they've got, and it takes less work to make them. Now what you need is the genetic material, but not every dog's cut out to be a bomb dog. And so I'd start them with that idea that hey, this dog may, uh, you know, and, and if you go, if you remember our last podcast, that's my background. Mm -hmm. um, so I, have, I still have a lot of contacts in that world. So. Um, so we'd always start them with the hope that man, maybe they got the, the, the right stuff to become a bomb dog. And if they don't, we'll kind of wash them down and they'll become a gun dog. Um, and uh, somewhere along the line, Althea came along, we're starting her out, and she just, man, she just, the easiest dog I've ever had to be around. And she does all the work, but if you don't, like, I'm just out playing with her this weekend. And I bet I'm, I'll be out in the lake with the baby, throwing around, and whatever, she's asleep on the bank. We get up, she won't, if we engage her, she's playing. But she's just, she's always in your orbit. But until you call her to action, she's not, she's not, you, you wouldn't even know she was there. And so when you're guiding and when you're training other people, and also we use her a lot when they're training the pointing dogs, um, that's just an enormous benefit to have a dog like that because you can just not think about them until you're ready to, to, to put them in the game. So that's it. That's where she speaks English. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, I, well, that's uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing you're you're looking at with with these dogs and with Grayson. Um, Sam, you wanted to uh, you want to take one of your questions now? You want yeah. To? Well, I guess before we before we get into anything, um, since we're talking labs, Emily, we haven't heard too much from you yet. <laughs> You've got a superstar young lab pup as well, I Ember. Do, yes. Tell us a little bit about Ember. Ember is so cool. So I got Ember because of Althea. And after spending so much time with Grace and Althea, you know, you guys spend time with Althea. She's 
freaking awesome. And yeah. there isn't anything she can't do. And I really admire that. And I am um, have GSPs and I'm very much a pointing dog person. Um, always had my own thoughts about labs that were, you know, big, fat, backyard bred American labs that <laughs> the most popular dog in America. Yeah. are not my type at all. I did not like labs one bit until I met Althea and you know she does so much for us. She We joke that she works harder than either of us do. Um, there isn't anything she can't do and I just think that is so cool. So I got my own lab, um, also a British lab who was bred locally by um, Logan Sheets with Grey Light Kennels. And um, actually the way it came about is Grayson was going to buy a puppy. And I said, well, why don't you just let me keep it for a little bit? Who doesn't want a little lab puppy? Yeah, sure. And then it turned into, no, she's not going anywhere. <laughs> um, so I got Ember to be my Althea, to uh -huh. do everything with me. And she has, she, she'll be six months old this week and she's already exceeded all my expectations. She's just, so cool. She, like Grayson says about Althea, she'll go everywhere, do anything with me, but she'll also do nothing. Mm -hmm. So if I have a couple of days where I don't have time for her, she just lays around, does nothing. But the second I'm like, let's do something, she is 110% in for whatever it is. So yeah. whether we're doing tricks for food or we're out in the kayak or we're going hiking, she went to Colorado with me and she hiked her little butt off and did so well being off leash and she's great with other dogs she's great with all people i didn't do anything with her all week took her to a vineyard on saturday she just laid at my feet while there were other people and dogs and kids and she rides shotgun in my car she's just go everywhere do everything kind of dog and i i really admire that and she's already titling her she, what was how, how old was she when she got her first title? <laughs> Nine weeks. She got her trick dog novice title. <laughs> she got, yeah, she got trick dog stuff online, and it's, it's wild, man. But yeah, it's, it's key. You see, she, she's a type of dog that can be trained in any any way yep. you want to train her. Yep. Which is pretty awesome. cool, too. Yep. That's awesome. So I guess I guess the framework for discussion, and again, we'll just keep it free form because it's more fun. But as a, as a new gun dog owner, and looking to be, you know, create a companion gun dog. Uh, the analogy that I was talking with Grayson about and Emily before the show was, you know, if you're cooking and you're you're new to creating an apple pie, you're creating your first apple pie, what you're going to do is you're not going to experiment in the kitchen and you know go wild. You're going to hopefully take a recipe and make a standard, good tasting apple pie. And I'm assuming that there's some sort of recipe. Just basic stuff. Obviously, y'all can experiment. Y'all have dogs come through and you've learned through experience and y'all are master chefs at this point with dogs. So are there tips or tools or things or timelines that you can do that are your basic recipe for creating a good companion gun dog from seven weeks when the puppy comes home with you kind of moving forward? Are there milestones that you're trying to hit or is it really just every, obviously every dog's different. So with the diversity of dogs and all these things are there are there milestones or not yes okay yeah i mean this is i mean this conversation can go in so many different directions and and i think if you listen if you do listen to our podcast i think something you're going to notice that we focus on a lot is like grounding yourself um and, and giving yourself a strong foundation in, in like basic knowledge yeah right and so we talk a lot about behaviorism and principles of behavior uh, and, and just put you on stuff that doesn't really necessarily, it's not a lot of step-by-step -step do this with your dog. Yeah. And I think your real success, people that have fun dogs to be around and watch do work, there's people that are into their dogs. Mm -hmm. They're going to spend time with their dogs. They're going to do some research away from it. Um, you know, they're going to, just like if they're into fishing, they're going to spend some time online going down rabbit holes, yeah. checking out fish and stuff. They're yeah. doing the same thing about dogs, mm -hmm. right? And so yeah, I just happen to like, I, I'm that same person that just is super obsessed with dogs, right? Yeah, like sure. so anybody that may be a great like a deer hunter, I'm a dog trainer before I'm a gun dog trainer. Yeah. So I've always, uh, I think I, I think it's always been really important for me to like feel like I have a, a strong base of knowledge. And I want, I think if you, if people have a dog and they've got these ambitions of doing things with their dogs, the first thing they need to do 
is educate themselves yeah. and, and, and focus on themselves as much as they're focusing on their puppy. If you carry, for the most part, you get your eight week old puppy and you just take them around and you expose them to all the environments that you possibly can, you're doing all the work you need to be doing until you're probably yeah, outside, out, done with TV. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can do other stuff. You can expose them to birds in that time. You know, you can do all these things. But, but those are, in my opinion, much less important than the time you spend with your dog paying attention to your dog. Yeah. And, it, and, uh, and so, you know, the first milestone I think that needs to be hit is having a very confident young dog yeah. that's confident in all environments, environmentally sound and ready to go with you. And then also focusing on yourself as what what are, what do I expect to do it so the, the most recent episode we just did um, yeah so I'm glad you brought it up yeah focused on reward based training fundamentals and I think and we always talk about and I'll say it over and over again hey when you're new and you're novice like the place to start or one place to start a way to do it it's not the only way to do it and I don't it's not the way that I do it for the most part I, I use reward based systems very rarely anymore because I just don't have the time um, but I do love them and believe in that and the power but if you're a novice and you got one dog you are not going to hurt your dog learning how to use a clicker and a treat bag yeah you're not going to mess anything up and i grew up with people that did not understand that or believe it necessarily that they thought treats were bribing your dog and would mess your dog up but you won't you can if you've got a bird dog you can do all the treat stuff in the world with it. When you expose it to a bird, it's not going to care <laughs> at all about your treat. Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's true. There's some genetics at play, and uh, and so, but I, I think that's it. First milestone. Those are those are them. You know, you have one for your puppy. That's about confidence. Obviously, health stuff, vaccinations. Is there anything you think I'm missing there? So something I'd like to bring up is that um, I'm very much into puppies and um, <laughs> critical socialization. Critical socialization period typically ends around 16 weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in general, it will vary from dog to dog, but in general, anything you want your dog to do well later in life, you should expose them to before 16 weeks of age. And so this is extremely important to me, and I know there's some conflicting information from vets out there, and what I encourage all my clients to do is do your research, because mm -hmm. there are pros and cons to everything. Um, but exposing your dog to as much as you can before 16 weeks old in a positive manner so not just making them afraid and saying that I exposed them but in a positive manner is really important so it's not just dogs everyone thinks socialization is getting your dog around other dogs it's dogs it's people it's um, environments so taking them to different places it's car rides it's textures walking on slippery surfaces walking on weird surfaces gravel it's sounds, hearing babies cry, hearing um, smoke alarms, hearing mm -hmm. ambulance, you know, all these different things are really, really important for young dogs to experience, um, some more so than others. So if you have a breed of dog that might be dog aggressive, it's really important to expose them to even more dogs or mm -hmm. a dog that, you know, might is a little bit timid in certain situations, exposing them more to those situations in positive manner. So, for, if you're looking for like hard and fast timelines, 16 weeks old, critical socialization period, that's really important. And then the other thing I just recommend is really working with puppies and getting them, we talked about this in our last podcast, but building their work ethic and you know developing a nice relationship with them. That's mm -hmm. super, super important. And I think if everyone just spent a couple minutes every day hand feeding their puppy for some work, it would certainly make our yeah. lives easier yeah. and uh, your life as well if you're going to be the one doing the training. And that's something that I picked up from our episode and from talking with y'all is, you know, they're in this critical period and they're learning to learn. Yep. Um, so having the dog eat out of your hand and work for their meal, you're developing a basically a lifelong skill of, you know, being able to work to please and, you know, to get a reward. Yep. Um, so that's something. When you said messing up you can't mess up with reward based systems if you were to do something aversive or whatever to in that young phase what what concerns do you have about what can you do to mess up a dog obviously gun shyness and things like that jumping into areas that are maybe scarier sure i mean pain is right pain's a, a, a and it, it it leaves an impression right so and, and you know I've, I've probably gone through this on the last podcast we did i i, I 
find it really important to be transparent with the language I use. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, a lot of people dance around um, what we do in dog training or what they may do in dog training. We use the terms pressure and things like that. And I, still, yeah. and I use the term pressure. Create an example yeah. you know, or stimulation. Yeah. Uh, and I use that term too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you're very, doing, but you're very honest about it. Well, but we, what we are doing, and, 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 and sometimes I overdo it. A lot of times we're talking about discomfort, and, I'll, and what I really mean is we're, or we're, I'm talking saying pain and discomfort would much more aptly describe what, yeah. what it is that's mm -hmm. happening. Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, we want to be very careful what those dogs associate with pain. Yeah. Right? Or with discomfort. Mm -hmm. Because we're teaching them to avoid the things they don't want when we use it a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, and with food, we're teaching them how to get the things they do want. And so that there's parallels to that. So we can take this food and we can put you in a, we can create a lot of stress because you want it really bad. And we're going to make you say, yeah, you got to do one more thing for it. You know, and, and you, you think really hard and you do it. And we are pushing your threshold for quitting up. Yeah. And we're developing a bit of a toughness and a work ethic in the dog that I, I really truly believe if you do this with your pups, it'll, you'll reap the benefits later when you do start some more formal training that involves compulsion and pain and pressure and stimulation and all, all those other great words. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know. I think, oh Go sorry, no, um, I think that you, the question you asked is ways you can mess up your yeah. puppy. Mm -hmm. um, one way that you can very easily mess up your puppy is by um, making the emotional state that you don't want the answer. And so when we talk about especially crate training, a very easy way to mess up your puppy is by letting them out of the crate when they're stressed or not crating them because they get stressed. Mm -hmm. um, that will do more damage than just crate training yeah. because they learn, they don't learn coping me mechanisms. They don't learn self-soothing. They don't learn how to deal with frustration. And that's a big, big problem because then when they don't understand how to um, calmly handle things that are frustrating, then things really escalate, and then we have all these problems, not just around crate training, but things like leash pressure. They don't understand how to work through that because they've never been forced to uh, work through any kind of frustration before. So a really easy way to mess them up is when they're frustrated, taking away whatever's frustrating so that they don't have to ever deal with frustration. Mm -hmm. So whether yeah. that be in the crate or another thing that we will commonly see is when a dog has a little bit of a dramatic moment on the leash, what do you do? You take the leash off, oh, it's yeah. okay, it's fine, uh -huh. it's okay. And then they learn, oh, whenever I feel discomfort, freak I mm -hmm. freak out and everything goes away. Yeah. And um, that is, that's definitely something that you can work through, Grace and I do all the time, but it's not fun for us or yeah. the dogs. Mm -hmm. And it can be easily, easily prevented by just allowing them to have that freak out moment once they're calm, then you let the pressure go and everything's fine. We mm -hmm. move on with our lives. Obviously with Ember and with your rewards-based system, um, you've, you're teaching this dog to learn. Yes. Um, she's learning skills and obviously doing very well. Uh, for somebody getting their first gun dog, like all those simple commands, sit, stay, crate, place, those are all things you want to teach in the, through your reward-based system and a treat bag in that critical learning period in that first 16 weeks? Um, the, they don't have to be done in those first 16 weeks, mm -hmm. but I do think it's, it's important to do some like clicker training in those first yeah. 16 weeks. Whether or not you accomplish anything, it really doesn't matter, mm -hmm. but getting their work ethic up um, and understanding if I do something, I can get rewarded for yeah. it. But those critical socialization, I think, pertains more to environmental soundness. So yeah. something that might be good for them is to put some food on a place cot and if you feel confident enough to walk up on the place cot and get it, that's socialization, getting yeah. up your feet up on something. Mm -hmm. um, but do you have to know how to go there on command by 16 weeks? No. Yeah. You'll see you'll see a lot of it's really popular in the like protection sports and police dog guys, but it, it, even you you're seeing more of it with kind of people raising litters of puppies now with gun dogs is They'll do things like take a baby pool and fill it full of empty bottles and, and feed them throw loose in there, throw their yeah. food in there, right? Mm -hmm. And the dogs have to go through all this immense stimulation that, you know, um, 
it's to, and I, I don't mean pain when I say that, but they're just being environmentally stimulated by getting in there. And it's things that would often freak them out, right? Different surfaces, yeah. all this noise, all this tactile stuff going on. And so the dogs begin to understand like, hey, I can, I can focus on the task at hand, which is just getting food in my belly, in spite of all this, this, the world getting crazy around me, and, and that helps them a lot. I mean, dogs that are environmentally sensitive, when they come to me, those are the ones that are really the hardest to start mm -hmm. because I can't train them through that. I have to allow them to become confident, you know, and so the biggest problem dogs I see when they get to me are the dogs that have never been out of the kennel, you know, and, they, and they're the whole new world, everything is, is a problem. Or out of the house. Or out of the house, or just you know off a off of a, a harness, right? They've never been on a on a on a collar of any sort. Or, you know, they're all these. So we want to expose them to these things. I don't. You know, I'll be honest though. I don't worry so much if I if they're getting bird exposure and stuff at that time. It's more that it's done correctly. Absolutely. You know, and and so yeah, I've, I've always used this anecdote, but probably the best natural bird dog that ever came through my kennel was three years old when he got there as a as a pointing dog. Um, he absolutely had the genetics behind him. Um, he was a super, super well-bred pointer. He was off of, uh, of like a, a recent national champion, um, which also would lead people to think like this dog's gonna be too much to handle. And interestingly enough, so he kind of it broke two misconceptions at the same time. Was number one, he started at three years old and became a fantastic bird dog. And number two was he kind of beat his genetics by becoming a sweet house dog at the same time. So he wasn't like a runoff renegade pointer. He was a dog that just soon had his head on your knee getting an ear scratch when he was out of drive. And so it, go, it goes to show you a couple things that genetics do work, but they also don't have to um, define. define you, right? Yeah. This is a big part of what we're talking about, which is these milestones, right? And, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've struggled so hard because I don't like to put myself in a, um, in a corner with who I'm going to be as a trainer or what type of dog I yeah. like. I would much rather have, you know, I'd rather see two, two dogs that are going to make a litter and like those two dogs regardless of their breeding. Um, whether they be American Labs or British Labs, like we tend to get our dogs now from British lines. Um, but at the same time, these British dogs come from a testing system or a trialing system that over the course of 100 or, or 200, you know, 150 years or so has produced a certain type of dog. And it's that, what are, what are the criteria for breeding? And if it comes down the pipe for a long, long time, you know, there's, and this could get, we could get a little too deep in the weeds with this, but there are, um, you know, lines of dogs we're looking for. If you have a system of breeding criteria, you don't necessarily have to have a lot of closely related ancestors to produce a specific type. That was that's a good point. I, I just listened to a podcast about um, and I didn't know if this this is a question about just the world in general that y'all are in. But it was this podcast that I listened to was um, I think it was a thirty for thirty those ESPN podcasts. Mm -hmm. and it was about horse training and uh, race horses. Sure. Three part series, very interesting. And it was going through kind of some of the cons of that world um, when it comes to steroid use and breeding. And one thing that it talked about was it was tracing the lineage of some of these thoroughbred horses, these just superstar horses, and tracing like horses that were in the whatever Belmont, and you could trace back, and they all came from the same exact horse, or the same three horses, every single one of them, and they were just inbred and to a degree sure. and is that is some of that in the dog world as well or not really super, not as much it's super prevalent but it's also important to note that you know, when we're talking and this is something we could have there's, there's i've got conflicting opinions within my own self on this yeah but it's important to note that if you had a purebred dog that you started with a relatively small gene pool yeah um, all pure purebred means inbred yeah yeah it's like, a, for, <laughs> for example yeah Every purebred dog is bred back to that same, you know, diversion of spe subspecies. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that I've learned, and you guys may see this or deal with vets a lot, you may talk to vets about it. I have had extensive con conversations with my vet about it. But with a purebred dog, the uh, possibility of complications in whelping pups is much higher. 
because they don't have a big genetic diversity of survival like the dog that's the street junkyard dog that has puppies under somebody's porch. Fourteen. And they all and they all live. And she's a good mama to all of them, and they all make just because she's got a big genetic diversity in her gene pool and purebred dogs are you got to kind of it, be think, on top of it yeah i mean i think well and i think some of the, there's some genetics at play I mean, there might be some environmental stuff at play too i think there's something to be said for like i mean we know now like antibacterial soap and things like that are hurting us to a degree sure and i think some of that certainly is at play in dogs and i think you know there's a there's always going to be a nature nurture debate on everything we do um there i believe in hybrid vigor, but I also know that like all dog, they're the same species, right? So Canis mm -hmm. lupus familiaris is, they, 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 there's a reason they can all interbreed. So um, I think we can find genetic diversity within our own breeds and have success like that. And I think also though I've seen it, like I, there's some blue hen females out there. That's what we, we call a, a female that's a really good reproducer that not only maybe produces really good puppies, but may produce big litters, and I've seen lines of females that produce big litters, you know, or they yep. can be bred. Same so with males. Yeah. Males that will throw right. big litters. Pre-potent yeah. sires that are going to mm -hmm. be, and not only throw big litters, but maybe throw great dog. They, they said that there was a, there was a dog named Evan Starlene Mack. It was a really famous American field trial retriever um, that was run by a man named Mike Lardy. And his famous quote was, you can breed him to a monkey and get a field champion. <laughs> you know, and, and there's something to be said for that. Yeah, for sure. Because I've got to check my, um, I've got to check my text real quick. I think Go there's something going on at home. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. Hop on out. I've got a, I've got a kind of a fun question, and we'll start with you. Okay. Um, you've got different people's dogs that live in your house. Uh, what is having a kennel on 4th of July like? In my house? Yeah, well I'm saying like when you've got other people's dogs um, and there's fireworks going off, uh -huh. is is Fourth of July in a kennel like a war zone or I mean is it awful? Um no. So actually so I have three dogs that aren't mine at my house right now. Uh -huh. And um, actually our neighbor was setting off fireworks this year and I didn't realize that was gonna go down. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so my three dogs, Blitz, Pinky, Amber, are all chill. Yeah. Well, they've all been exposed to gunfire, yeah, and so they're chill. all fine. And so usually dogs that have been exposed to gunfire are fine with fireworks yeah. for mm -hmm. the most part. Um, so mine, all three were fine. I do have a client dog who gave me a heads up that she was not good with fireworks, but I keep all my client dogs in crates, and yeah. she did just fine. Good. And I actually did notice that when our neighbor was setting off fireworks, none of the kennel dogs None of Grayson's kennel dogs were barking or doing anything, so. It's, I, I'm not sure it's gunfire. I, I, I have seen examples of dogs that were great field dogs and that had problems with, with that. I think it's, I think big biggest thing is how do we, approach like, the situation. how do we approach the situation, right? So if my dog acts a little stressy, what do I do? Yeah. Do I comfort that dog immediately? Or like when I got a kid, that's it maybe having a little emotional sh I hate drawing these parallels and I hate when other people make them as well. <laughs> right? You know, I mean, I'm sure your wife is corrected you as much as God has me, but it's the same thing. <laughs> you know, we got a toddler, man, and, and yeah, you know, sometimes he legitimately is hurt and he needs to be comforted. Sometimes he's in emotional distress and, and comfort is the right thing to do. Sometimes the right thing to do is to laugh it off with him. Yeah. Sometimes the right thing to do is outright ignore him while he's in You're his fine. Yep. Just, Let's move on. We're moving. Guys, what, is he, what does Boone say? <laughs> which which time? What does he say? Well, yes. uh, no, the one when you uh, he said like it's all right. Oh, it's yeah. not too bad. It's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too bad. <laughs> He's heard me say it so much. He's like it's not too bad, Dad. He calls him uh, Dad. Yeah, it's not like D A T. -E. <laughs> Kids these days. Right? I think, yeah. it's, it's, uh, he's, he's three. And he's already using slang. <laughs> We're right behind you, and ours is starting to make. It's string together nonsense sentences, so it's fun to, fun to pay attention. But there's, there's a lot of parallels to that. And so, you know, fireworks, man. You know, if, if, if my kid was afraid of fireworks, I wouldn't, like, freak out and run him into the house and act yeah. like there's a, it's a yeah. combat zone outside. Yeah. You know, we might find a way to, to, uh, to, to take a little bit of the stimulus and that stress, you know, to, to mitigate that. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to sit there and just coddle him uh -huh. and yeah. make it a big deal. I'm not going to grab out earmuffs for him. I'm yeah. going to hand him a lighter. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. well, you know, I was like, 
you know, you just, I agree with it. I agree with everything you guys just said. Yeah, totally. This goes for a lot of situations with dogs, though. Yeah. A lot of the problems arise because we coddle situations rather than allowing dogs to feel the frustration and work through them. Um, and so creating them is always a great option if they're great in the crate for fireworks. Um, and there's a big parallel to car sickness, too. Dogs that get stressed out and anxious and worried in the car, a lot of times all you have to do is crate them and then suddenly their car sickness goes away because mm -hmm. they just all they need is a little bit of structure to say, hey, your only job is to just lay here. Yeah. Sure. Another, I think another thing, too, she mentioned the kennel dogs. Um, there's some old wisdom in bird dogs that, you know, for one thing, one thing I still do, and it, it kind of runs contrary to some things I believe, is I still use a chain gang when I train. I put all the, I really like to bring the Explain young dogs. Explain what that is. So chain gang is like a stake outpost where you might tie a dog out with a chain. Um, for me, I use about a 30 to 40 foot chain and I run two or three foot sections off of that and I put six dogs, you know, six dogs on one long chain. So they're all on there together. When one dog barks and freaks out, his neighbors are getting yanked around. Um, puppies that maybe are learning to deal with the, that tactile sensation of having a collar on their neck, they're going to go out there and it's, they're not going to be happy the first time they go on that thing. It's going to really overstimulate them. Um, through the course of time, there's, a, there's like this energy that happens though, for the most part. Some dogs are just crazy yeah. in the head. But a lot of times you put six, six dogs on a chain gang and you come back and as long as you put them on there with a mature, couple of mature dogs that can relax in the face of a lot of, of heavy stimulation, all of a sudden that kind of gets spread down the line and, and other dogs are becoming much more relaxed that normally otherwise may not be. Um, I've got like my dog Pete, for example. Like I put him on the chain gang, he goes to sleep, it doesn't matter. He'll get tossed from one side of that chain gang <laughs> to the other by the other dogs. And before you know it, you watch from him, that, that kind of vibe kind of spreads out from him. Like yeah. everybody begins to mellow. Also though, there's lessons to be learned on that, that, you know, hey, another dog goes on point over there. You all now have the ability to watch that. I don't believe that a dog can watch another dog and learn from what they're seeing that dog do, but I do believe they can make associations. Like, hey, when I see a dog on point, a bird's about to appear. Yeah. Right? So it's something I need to pay attention to, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, you know, those kind of things, I, I just feel the kennel has that same thing. Like, the, the kennel peaks and you know, valleys yeah. together. And... You know, when they get stimulated, they all come yep. up at one time. But you can run fireworks for 20 minutes, and I guarantee you, they're not going to, that kennel I got going right now is not going to bark for 20 minutes. They may yep. bark for two or three, and they're going to be like, okay, it doesn't affect us, we're going back, you know, yeah. to sleep. I think yeah. that's one of the things you pay for. When you have a trainer train your dog, it's not necessarily that you're lazy or you don't have the time, that may be the case. But I think a lot of it you're paying for is having your dog around other experienced dogs. Sure. And getting that vibe spread across the room because you, I mean, Sam, for example, you can't do that at your house. You got yeah. the one puppy, yeah, and you're having you're having to be the the pack leader. I mean, it's, like you said, I mean, they're still pack animals to a degree. Sure. And when that one dog's calm or when that one dog goes on point, they may not see that dog and say, "Oh, he's on point." That's what we're supposed to be doing. But they do say, "Hey, that's the job we do," and they're going to see that and see that that one dog's getting rewarded for. A good job well done and it could relate I mean I think it's all part of the thing and like back in a point that's something that you can't train your dog to do unless you got another dog I mean you just you just can't do it it's well, go ahead there's just so there's I do a lot of pack socialization work and I think there it, it does have tremendous mental emotional benefits with the right pack so right. does this mean you take your dog to the dog park and you get benefits <laughs> no. absolutely not it's not the right pack almost the, every time yeah 100 I, I, I promise you that's not going to benefit your dog at all but um i have a lot of really calm stable appropriate dogs and when i get dogs that are off balance especially mentally emotionally bringing them around my pack my pack does not tolerate that because you that energy, like Grayson was talking about on the chain gang, disrupts the overall energy of the pack. And my dogs, who are very appropriate, will not tolerate weird behavior. Yeah. Cut it out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so there, I see a lot of benefit for dogs that have mental, emotional instabilities that are around my dogs who go, hey, just cut it out, right? There's no need to be doing that. And they, they gain so much from that. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, a lot... And my, for me, so the, the things that you were saying, Cody, uh, can certainly hold true, but there, 
but I might, the, the real benefits are untenable. They're things that you can't observe. Yep. You know, and, and the, I, you know, they are, so Althea, for example, like this is one place where she's an enormous help to us is if I have a dog that's a, that's a little trepidatious about a bird early, and, and one, the, one of the cool things about Althea where she kind of melts into the background, you don't recognize her, she sits in my truck all day. In the, in the cab of my truck all day while I'm training all the other dogs. Leave the door open for the most part. She's happy to go to sleep in there. And when I need her, I just hit a few, you know, uh, uh, hit the whistle a few times and phew, she bolts out. She knows usually what that means is, hey, there's a bird in play and I get to do my job and she's excited. So she bolts into the situation, finds a bird, grabs it, prays around in front of the dog, brings it to me. And then all of a sudden that dog that may be a little trepidatious about that bird is emboldened by mm -hmm. by seeing her do it, and then maybe there's a little competition because I have such clean control of her, I can stud that bird back out for that puppy or that young. Yeah, boy. And he wants to get there first. Now he wants to get there first, and if, if he doesn't, then I'll think. Guess what? I think he'll get it. And she, she goes and gets it again and creates that competition. Yeah. And all of a sudden, this is the job. Yeah, this is yeah, the job, and it's happening. So yeah, I mean, there's huge benefits to having multiple dogs. It does help to have a lot of control. I love like we talked about before. I got a squirrel dog. Um, you want to start a hound, or you want to start a tree dog or any dog that's out there that independent, you ain't doing it without other dogs in mind. Unless, well, that, you can, but it takes a lot of boot leather, and it sure does help to have other dogs out there doing it. Yeah, that. and that and that's where I'm I relate it to. Like the pack thing with with tree dogs yeah, yeah. specifically, training a tree dog to tree without <laughs> another dog is tough. It is because they just can't figure out. You can't point a dog's head up in a tree and say, "Look, there's a squirrel." <laughs> I mean, you see them. <laughs> He'll look 10 miles past where you're trying to get him to look. It doesn't matter if the squirrel moves or not. He's not going to see it unless he just sees it. Yep. But when there's other dogs barking up that tree, he's going to get excited and think there's something And, and going eventually on. you got to break him out and, and shoot him out his own game. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've got one, the one I got at home, you can't run her with other dogs anymore because she just likes to sit back and wait for the other dogs to yeah. go to work. Well, my yeah. other squirrel dog, my squirrel dog was the same way. Yeah, I couldn't run with other dogs because once he got to the tree, he could fight them all yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, he wanted that thing. Yeah, he wanted, it was, it was his deal, and it didn't matter who else was there. He was going to whoop them, yeah. and it was still going to be his deal. Yeah. Um, so he was the bad squirrel dog in that regard. I mean, yeah, but not, a, not a competition dog. I like running my singles anyway. I, I enjoy well, having one dog in the woods at a time for that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good advice. Sam's got enough free advice. Let's talk about yeah. Let's move on. Uh, they'll send you a bill, Sam, that's right. that's for, right. for all for all that stuff. But um, getting into your uh, your dog situations and and talking about it from a conservation standpoint, mm -hmm. which I don't think we ever. I think individually when we interviewed you guys and talked, we definitely tied it back together a little bit with conservation, but we didn't really talk about the dog's role. In conservation, and since we're all, everyone sitting at the table owns a retrieving dog. Um, I think it's important to relay the benefits from a conservation standpoint to owning a retrieving dog. Sam and I just took a four-hour ride one way to Pamlico to pick up some pipes for uh, a water restoration project. So on the way, of course, dogs came up in the truck cab for half the ride or so. And one of the things we were talking about was duck hunting and the ducks that we have shot at times and lost that we wish we could have got. Um, we both have a Drake shoveler that's somewhere in the ether now because we didn't have a dog when we shot it down. Whereas if we'd have had a retrieving dog, there's a high likelihood we would have gotten that duck and it'd be hanging on my wall and his wall and, and we'd be showing you guys when you come over to the house. So check that out. <laughs> Instead, we can just tell you this story of you know loss and sorrow. But with a retriever, if you have a good retriever, and even if you have a mediocre retriever, I think you're better off than not in terms of conservation from a, from a waterfowl and bird hunting standpoint because, one, humans can't smell birds, which I wish we could because that would be awesome. <laughs> but uh, we can't smell them, and we really can't see them the way dogs can either. I mean, a dove laying in a cornfield is almost impossible to spot when it's down. But a dog with the combination of sight and their nose, they can just, and that's what they're bred to do. That's what they're born to do is find game. And having that, it, how does it relate to conservation? Well, one, if you shoot 15 birds and you find all 15, you've only shot your 15 doves. But if you're a dude without a dog or a girl without a dog and you shoot 
15 birds, you've probably found nine of them. Your limit's what's in your five gallon bucket. And your limit, yeah. yeah. And so guess what? You're gonna keep shooting until you find 15 birds. Yeah. So you lost six. That's that's the difference versus, you know, the guy with the dog may only shoot exactly 15. I mean, I can't remember. I've only lost since I've had my dog, especially the team of two that I hunt with now. I only lose maybe three, four birds a year. And I mean, I hunt cutovers and places where I would never think to hunt without a dog. And it's because I have the dogs, I have that confidence and we can find them. We're not losing birds. Same goes for ducks. And with duck populations, what they are, I don't think we can afford to be shooting extra ducks down that we don't retrieve or don't find. So the dog plays a huge role in that and has forever. Yeah. But um, my thoughts are, if you're not hunting with a retriever or a buddy with a retriever, you're not hunting responsibly. To some degree, I think that's fair. I, I do. I believe. Yeah. I mean, I believe if you're if you're duck hunting, if you're hunting, if you're hunting game birds at all, and you're not hunting with a dog, you're 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 borderline irresponsible. I mean, it's hard to say because it's yeah, and it, people it, be in the woods anyway. It's pushing a button, and and I'll people are gonna hate me, and I don't care. <laughs> uh, I, I don't care. Um, you, I want you to come to the dove hunt whether you got a dog or not, because guess what? There's gonna be dogs there. Yeah. We're gonna find your birds. Yeah, um, my dogs get tons of retrieves every year, and yours will too. Sure. And everybody's will. But um, you know, don't stop bird hunting because you don't have a dog. But definitely consider having a dog, or if you don't have the time to invest in that or the money, somebody out there has got a dog that they really probably don't care much about shooting, but they sure enough like watching their dog retrieve. Yep, there are a lot of those people. I tell you from I tell you how their role in conservation is another one. I mean, you you nailed it with that. In terms of not just retrieving game, wounded game, cripple game, whatever, um, the great majority of my clients are into their dogs before they're into hunting. Sure. I would be probably be lying to say that I would be this involved in consumptive outdoor pursuits without the dogs. Really? Okay. Yeah. It's just not. I mean, I, I love it, um, but I. The, Really not that ate up with it. I don't deer hunt a lot. I, mm -hmm. You know, I, and, and those other things. It's I just I really the dogs get me out sure. more than anything else. That is an enormous benefit to conservation. I mean, I spend a ton of money yep. that, that is <laughs> benefiting Pittman Robertson, and as do my clients. And in in the North American model of conservation, that's that's where we're at, and that's where we're, that's how we get our big wins. Mm -hmm. It's about people being involved, and, and it brings a lot of people to, to the table. And dog people are consistent. They don't skip out a season because of, of personal reasons or whatever, because their dogs need to go. So even if you don't feel it or you're not up to it, you're doing it because your dog's into it. And that and that's me. Like I'm going to take out of state trips every year because guess what? That's where the birds are, and my dogs need it. I, I may not be able to afford it, but <laughs> we're going anyway. Well, yeah, yeah. Don't tell my wife, right? Um, but yeah, and I, Emily, I know that's your story. I mean, yeah. you were into it because of your dogs, and, yep. and then you're like, then you transitioned into the other side. Yeah, I would not be hunting at all if it weren't for my dog. Yeah. In fact, I won't go hunting if I can't take my dog. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, if you, I agree. We talked about that yeah. before. Yeah, if, uh, if you I'm invite me to go on a duck hunt, and, and, and you're like, but don't bring the dogs into the foul. <laughs> How good is this duck hunt? I guess. As but, a formerly irresponsible hunter. Um, <laughs> who didn't have dogs, which I take no offense to. I've like certainly been in situations where I've shot down ducks and known that I could have had a dog, I could have had a companion who would have found that. And to say that there isn't a feeling of guilt, uh, and you know, even beyond, even beyond just like kind of an ethical and moral responsibility to find your game, like the amount of work and time for somebody, probably plenty of people listening, who've shot down game and felt that moral responsibility to find it, think of all the hours and time that you've spent looking for game. So not only are you ethically and morally responsible for going and finding it, but you know, without a dog there, what are you gonna do? You shoot down your first duck of the morning, prime time, it's legal shooting time, just come around, you shot one, it's still swimming. You're gonna get out of the blind as an ethical and moral hunter and you're gonna go and look for that bird. And you're missing out. You're missing out on the peak time to be sitting in that blind hunker down because you're tr doing the right thing. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened, but I'm not gonna keep shooting when I have one swimming around and I can't find it because it's just not the right thing to do. So not you can be selfish about it. I mean, that's there's nothing wrong with 
you're you out there. You you got up at three thirty in the morning to pull the trigger and to get your get your birds and um, you know think think about yourself and think about the time that you spent and wasted and you're pissed off because you're looking for a bird that you can't find and birds are buzzing over your blind or wherever you're hunkered down at and you can't shoot because you're looking. I mean it's you can be selfish about it. They're they're a tool as long as long as a, or as well as a friend. So. Um, just think about that. I mean, if you're thinking, and I'm very much excited for all a lot of the people with dogs that I uh, admire. Tell you, tell me that you know this is a new frontier for you. And as much as you going out with hunting and how much you enjoy it, how much more I'm going to enjoy it with my friend out there with me. Yep. And and like the retrieve is going to mean more than pulling the trigger at some point, you know. And that's I'm yep. very much excited about. It's just growth, I think. The only birds I ever think about keeping at all to mount are because of my dogs. Oh, yeah. The story that went with yeah. it. Oh, it was a 300 yard retrieve and there were, you know, ice on it. And, you know, those are the ones that I definitely think about. It was snowing and snow was stuck to her ears. You know, those stories. They're the great story. We have a story. Mm -hmm. We're getting to Mayhem Day. Yes, sir. Oh, Pete. Um, we'd given up on one. I was sitting on one side. It's a perfect story. Yeah. I was on one side of the pond. Uh, Sam was on the other. Sam Sam got one that sailed and went somewhere. And Althea and I were not anywhere near marking it. And we went up and searched the area, that, you know, just with her nose on the ground, looked for an area that we thought it might be. And we, we finally said, well, you know, we, yep. we messed up here. We didn't get it. So we turned uh, we turned out the bird dogs, turned out my Brittany's to go for a woodcock hunt at the end, or just to go take a walk around the property, I think. And here comes Pete rolled up with a bird. Found it. Yeah. Found him about 250 yards and away from where he yeah. went down. Complete opposite direction. In <laughs> on dry grass, you know. Sam, he must be a contagious. Like, Sam and I duck hunted together one morning, first light. We, we shot down a, a wood duck, and Sam's like, well, we better go find him. I'm like, ah, we'll, we'll get him a little bit. Don't worry about it. I'm not getting up just yet. And uh, we hunted the morning, you know, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna send the dog over there. She'll find him. And Sam, I, I could see in Sam's face, he's like, this is never gonna happen. She's not, I mean, the bird was alive and it was down for over an hour in the river. She's not gonna find it. Send her up the bank, she's swimming up the bank. Next thing you know, you see her cut up into the woods. I was like, oh, get ready. Here comes the duck running out. Here comes the dog peeling off after it, you know? And Sam's like, I cannot believe I was like, yeah, dude, we don't waste we don't waste the, the prime time of the morning <laughs> messing around with that. We'll get that in a little bit. I'm not worried about it. Yeah, I worry about it. I, and you know, I'm looking forward to the. Thing you can do that. Yeah, when I can do that. Yeah, there's a lot, and, and I and I think that goes to you having a lab now, and, and you being a Boykin man. Um, the Boykins probably are not as hamstrung by the tradition as the labs, but in this country, mm -hmm. labs. Are a, are a waterfowl dog, yep. we, and I and I, I and I am somebody. I believe that the American system of field trialing has benefited the breed as much as anything, and I'm glad that there are certain dogs that exist out there. But it really focuses on a couple of things that get missed, and and, and namely big long marks. That's where those eyes come in. You see a dog yeah. that if it's genetically um, uh, engineered to mark long birds. It's a different animal. Yeah, and what you mean is the way their face is shaped. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, and they just and that, and they've got better yep. eyes. I mean, yep. they get they can watch something drop, and I promise you, I can't walk to that bird, but that dog will step on it yep. on the way out there, and that's genetic. Even though they train for it, yep. our dogs don't do it as well because they're from England, and mm -hmm. they don't do that kind of stuff over there as much. I think now this is there's just like earlier, there's a nature and a nurture component to this. I want my dogs to break down and hunt, and I'm not if they don't pet, pin a mark. I'm not going to stop them and handle them around. Sure. I want I want you to put your nose on it. Spend some time. And I want you to just just take the time, all the time you need out there. If I turn a dog loose and it stays out for a half hour, I know it's working. You know, I put enough time into yeah, it. Yeah, Napper's big on that. It's, it's <laughs> a Napper game. Yeah, you know, they're big on the yeah. take the time and whatever it takes. Just, yeah. just find it. So, yeah. Yeah. Important things to know. But, I mean, it's also doesn't mean if you're playing field trials, not a knock on anybody because that game really does make the best dogs for breeding selection. I mean, we need it, but if you're hunting out there, let those dogs let those dogs take a little extra time to do what they need to do and, and work towards the birds. Uh, I've got a question, and I've gotten conflicting answers from the two of you. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings. So, when I asked Cody, and it's it's great. I've got 
so many resources that I can ask questions, and I'm very fortunate. And um, Cody was talking about Ellie, his dog, who's an excellent hunting dog. And I was like, when did you introduce gunfire to Ellie? And he said, I would walk through the woods. He was in a situation similar to I am, where I lived out in sticks <laughs> and, and was out in the woods a lot and got to expose his dogs to the woods a whole lot. And you, your answer to me was, she, I brought her home, and that week I was walking around carrying her or letting her walk behind me, and I had a twenty two. and every once in a while I would just shoot my twenty two and expose her to gunfire real early. I came over to your place, and I was like, what I'm thinking about doing is I'm going to introduce her to gunfire and probably go out to a field and shoot 200 yards away and just like slowly introduce her to gunfire. And you were like, hold on, hold up. You know, there's, there's, this is one of those areas where you can mess up. And you, and so I'm, I'm happy to take, but I feel like there's so many different answers. Like everybody's got a different answer. Of, oh, here's how you introduce a dog to gunfire. What is, what is the, is there an answer? Well, here, here's what I'll say to that. There have been, I've had, I've gun shot dogs. Um, I've, I've, as a as a professional trainer, if you send me your dog and I send it back gunshot, there's not about a, there's not much worse I can do. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. There's like that's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, and and so and I and I rehab a lot of gunshots. And so for me, it makes a lot of sense to to take take some time, have some structure, and to look at have a game plan when I when I plan to do it. And and one thing I know that gives me an advantage is if, if when I fire that gun, I can make, I can develop a, for lack of a better term, a positive association between that gunfire and, and um, this usually game, I can kind of capture a moment of dopamine in that dog's brain. Yeah. Where they're hearing this and all of a sudden that, that gunfire, not only does the dog not care about it, does it is it not um, over, overly stimulating them and scaring them, it's becoming associated with the best thing in the world for them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to capture for me. So I always wait till I can get a dog in either chase of live game or play in a retrieve game and in a high state of drive. And that's when I'm going to introduce my gunfire at distance and bring it in slowly. Um, there's, there's methods to that that are a little different, but for me it'll always kind of stay associated with game because what I want, at least early, is to, is to hopefully um, develop that association quickly. Yeah. Now, you may do it without that, but eventually when you start hunting, that gunfire's gonna take, develop that association anyway. Yeah, sure. One thing for like, now that I train trial dogs too and stuff like that, one thing that I do is, is I wanna, first I wanna make them associate that gunfire with the game and feel all that, yeah, that drive and have that dopamine response when they're hearing it, have that association built, now I'm gonna break that association and make that gunfire uh, completely meaningless so that my dogs don't break when they hear yeah. that, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if, and so there's other things. But that's, you know, I mean, if you got, genetically, if you got the right dog to start with, you should probably be able to roll out there and mm -hmm. hop off the 22. And I, I'm with you. you I'm know. with you. And there's also, like, don't take mine, but I'm not a professional trainer. So yeah. Like, I'll, I'll train a, a dozen dogs in my life that are bird dogs. Yeah. If I'm lucky. Um, Grayson's going to train... 500, more, you know, yeah. or more, but it's, and, and so, it, you know, but that's the way I did. Yeah, and I think, like, to what you were saying, each dog is an investment, and you want to be as careful as you can uh, with having the end product that you want. So, if it means being a little bit more thoughtful in your procedure to create that and not put them in a situation where there's the potential to mess that dog up and you basically got a dud and you've got a house dog and that's okay. You know, it'll be a friend and it can, you know, it can hang out. But really, if you're going into it from a companion gun dog as the end goal of this dog, you know, being careful and methodical is probably the way to go, I would guess. Absolutely. I think, I think with, it, with all things, whether we're talking birds and we've, this kind of runs a little contrary to something we talked about earlier with expo early exposure, but with birds and, and gunfire especially, because we know this is going to be this is going to be their job for the rest of their lives if everything goes right. It never will pay to be in a hurry, yeah. um, and that's it. Doesn't you don't need to, you know? And, and if you've got support from a professional, 
Um, if you don't, then then it's a good opportunity to just read up on something and try it. You know, try it a very the most conservative way possible is always good. If it's a bird dog, it's all, it's going to be a bird dog. Yeah. You don't need you don't like you know the people. What gunfire is one of the things people are like, man, I got to get it done. I got to get it yeah. done. I got to get it done. No, you don't. You know, and forego opening day a dove if your dog isn't exposed to gunfire and you haven't had the opportunity to do it appropriately. It's not, it's, it, it, it's you're, not worth yeah, it. have that day when the time is right. And, and um, it's hard, man, because I know it, I felt that same feeling, man. You want, you want that pup to be involved. Yeah. You want it there and yeah. you get, and, you, and it, but one of the things I hate, we all have things we don't like about our jobs, is the time constrictions that I have. I have to do things either fast or and it's not fair for me to just hang on. And I tell people this all the time. But your dog really needs this to be hunted. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you to leave it with me to be hunted. You know, and, and take it home. Bring it back to me next season, next spring. You know, let's talk about it or whatever. This gunfire is one of those things that just just needs just needs to be to have its time taken with it, and it's going to pay pay you off. But it's uh, just because I and I'm overly sensitive to it because I see it more than other people. You know, yeah. but probably most dogs be fine. Yeah, probably most dogs would be fine for sure, but but uh, at the end of the day, I don't get, I, I get the problem dogs. That's, yeah. that's what people send to me. So. With Ember, you said she's been exposed. Um, how did you do it? Uh, the same way we do it with all the dogs. So she had a lot of um, really early quail introductions. We used Ember while Althea was on maternity leave, um, getting Ember to retrieve quail for dogs that were a little bit. Um, timid about them and so the way we do it is we start with clipped wing quail so that they're really fun and exciting yeah. and we have um, a whip we crack we start with that because it's not as loud as the 22 and then you know it's especially important to watch how they respond but she's so, so Ember's the kind of dog that I could have probably taken her to a shooting range and yeah. at eight mm -hmm. weeks old and she would have been fine and that's yeah. I think where really What's important here is that just because one person did it and their dog was fine does not mean your dog will be yeah. fine with the same thing. So, mm -hmm. being cautious and you know really taking your time with it is going to be important. Yeah. There's no need to rush it. But mm -hmm. she had a lot of lot of early bird introductions, and so she was introduced to gunfire pretty quickly. And that's so. One thing I like to do now. We, you know, it's kind of a, this. This might be a segue. Um, is I am. We've talked about it before. I'm trying to get more into coaching. And I like for people to come to me. Yeah, I've done a, this is a time, like, and I mean, if you're not close to me and you don't have access, I, I guarantee you can find somebody in your area that's either a professional trainer or an advanced hobbyist that would be willing for you for a couple of bucks. Um, I know uh, the guys at Sand Hills Point and Breeds Club, there's always somebody down there willing to help somebody. Find those things, find an avid chapter. Um, and just find and make sure whoever you're dealing with is conservative. And wants yeah. to take their time and help you. Let them help you with the bird and the gunfire intro. Or come to me and see me. And you know, we do it, you know, it's it's it'll be worth your time and your money. It's a good investment. And it just keeps you from having that heartbreak. There's nothing worse than gunshot and a dog. It's the worst feeling in the world. You know the moment it happens. You know, I did it with one of my dogs, man, early on. I took him out of the woods and he was running around and he, I bought him. A little older, the guy told me he was gun broke and everything else, and um, he was uh, he was just tooting around the woods, and I was like, I can crack a shot off, see how he does. With my 20 gauge over his head, and he just looked at me. His eyes got real wide, and he Bye. said goodbye, <laughs> and I had to chase him down in the truck. I mean, he was just going down the highway at about 25 miles an hour, right. you know. And, and guess what? He recovered. It took me a year to bring him back. Um, but I did, but I'll never forget the moment I did that and that feeling that I saw when I saw that look in that dog's eye and I'm like, oh, there I go. There's not only the money, but I liked it. He was yeah. a good dog, and, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and so it was just like, you know, it's a, it's a, and now you got to make that decision, like, how much do I like this dog? Is yeah. he staying a member of my family even though he's not going to be what I wanted him to be? You know, mm -hmm. so things like that, you know, it's not, and I, and I don't mean that to run Well, I, I think Sam also didn't 
give an honest thread. He gave it a little uh, content. It's like, my dog was around loud noise. Like, yeah. it's not just gunfire. It's sure. just mm -hmm. big noise. Yeah. Sure. And she rode in the bulldozer with me from the time she was. Sure. Well, sure. I mean, I brought her to work and Absolutely. she rode on a tractor in a bulldozer. Like, and so, yeah, every day when we walk, of course, I was yeah. target practicing, doing whatever. And yeah. it's just like normal. It's like mm -hmm. daily yeah. life. And, life. And one thing you did is, it, you know, you didn't make a deal out of it. Yeah, yeah, it's, right? yeah it's, things you like just had to understand that loud noises are part of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know. and, it's, and so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think. You know, again, you know, it's there's a million ways to skin a cat. If you're worried about it, one thing, if you're worried about it, it's, it's a good thing to not yeah. do it on the yeah. app, right? And so, yeah. One yeah. Thing, the confidence comes down the line a lot. So, yeah. you know, if, if you're not, if you're out there cracking off your 22 and you're like, I hope I don't screw this up, <laughs> then odds are you. There's, you're going to get this energy off, right? Yeah. And so, I, yeah, same with riding a horse. Like, if you're nervous when you climb on a horse, that horse is going to be nervous. Yeah, uh, that's why I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't walk with another yeah, dog. Yeah, so I, I, totally, I totally agree. Like, it's a confidence thing if you're if you're going into it different than a, and you know if you just know inherently know that it's going to be fine. And it's and all you super confident folks that don't be go blasting over your dog. Yeah, right now, yeah, know. and that's and that's one thing. The reason I asked was I'm not I'm not nervous. Sure, um, she's. She's, um, w when she was eight weeks old, the guys across the creek from me were banging off shots. Sure, sure. And, you know, we didn't make a big deal of it, and I learned from our podcast to just act like it's normal. It's normal sure. life. No worries. No problem. She's been around power tools. She's been, I mean, she's living in a construction site. So, um, she, I'm not worried about it. However, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk anything. And that's why that's why I ask because I mean why 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 should I I'm not gonna I'm gonna stay methodical and, and that's good advice I guess. and I think I'll be honest that's probably a really good um, episode for for Emily and I down the road and talk just talk about our own experiences because we can go on man I mean yeah the two the two things that that I see that that I that really are the real rehabs that have to be dealt with are gonna be bird shyness and gun shyness absolutely and. When you get them, you're like, and, and I don't care what pro trainer out there says what, there's no guarantees. When you get a gun shy dog in, there's no guarantee you're going to fix them. Now, there's a good chance. We, I mean, we, we can bring a lot of dogs through, um, and it's worth a shot, in my opinion. There's some dogs that are never going to come through, depending on the, the, the emotional state you're starting. Yeah, I'm glad, you said, I'm glad you said that. I was talking to Sam earlier, and I was like, you know, I think it's important to be clear that not all dogs are winners. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, if you've got a puppy and you pay big money for it, it doesn't mean that it's a big money dog. That's fact. Right. Um, and you might not recognize it for three months, yeah. but there, there's going to come a point where maybe it's worth, you know, putting this dog in a situation that it's good at, that it's good in the home, it's good with kids, it's good as a, you know, an emotional pet, whatever, but it's not going to be a gun dog. And, that, and I think there may be a, there's probably an argument for a professional trainer in, in that regard. We take a lot of dogs that I don't think... It, without a little extra help, would, would turn into good gun dogs. Absolutely. And we get them. And it, well, our, you know, I tell folks, man, my, my job is to make to help this dog achieve its potential. Yeah. You know, and if the, you baseline, start, the baseline is different for yeah, every dog. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you're starting with a dog that's going to be a good dog, well, that sure makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And I tell, I mean, I, we get up, man. It's yeah. always so nice when somebody sends us one of those because you're like. This is the one. Now, I mean, I'm going to pay attention to him. He's going to get all the good work, but I don't have to worry about him. Yeah. Well, for you every one of those, yeah. For every one of those, there's going to be three of the other ones. Can I take Please. a moment and talk about something that's really important to me, which is buying from a reputable breeder? Yeah. I know we talked about this on our individual podcasts, but if you want a gun dog, the most important thing you can do is find a good breeder. Because if you want a good gun dog, just because you go and find a lab on Craigslist, does not mean that dog is going to be a gun dog. Especially with pointing dogs. And I have a lot of people who I know buy GSPs because they're pretty and yeah. they're so, such and such. And they have some serious intentions to hunt them. And it is, Grace, I'll tell you, it's the most heartbreaking thing of our job to, to tell someone their dog's not going to be a gun dog. But you and that's, do it. That's what they want, but we cannot, there is absolutely nothing Grayson and I can do about that. If your dog does not want to hunt, there are, there's nothing we can do. We can try, we can try to, you know, get them really excited about birds, but if at the end of the day, they don't want to be a gun dog, they don't want to be a gun dog, and it's really, really heartbreaking to have to have that conversation, and the best thing you can do to prevent that is to find a dog that comes from a reputable breeder that means 
they hunt their dogs, they do the things with their dogs that you want to do. So if you want to yep. duck hunt, find a breeder that duck hunts their dogs. Yeah, if he can't show you pictures or she can't show you pictures of their dogs doing it, just yeah. go on and move on to the next one. I've got a I've video got a of all of it. Yeah. Um, so you have people that will come and they'll hire your services to make these dogs great. This is kind of more of a fun question, but uh, I think it's good advice. So. I feel like there's this tendency where it's almost like it's a pride thing where these clients will come and they're not going to want to like, they're going to be like, oh, I could have trained it or, but I just, you know, da, 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 or, and it goes for anything. You, you hire somebody to mow your lawn and you're going to be like, oh, you know, and tell them, <laughs> tell you, it's like, the, it's, it's, it's the wrong Swanson yeah. paradigm. Like, yeah. 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 yeah, I could mow it, but you know, and this and that and tell you how like, Oh, I'm. I actually used to have a mowing business, and you know, <laughs> but I just you know, I used to I used to live at the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always something where everybody's on at the point. Somebody's going to come in, and they're going to tell you that they're you know that they're a great trainer, but they're you know all this. Is there? What is your advice to somebody who comes in and is dropping their dog off to you? To just like, is it just kind of more so? You're bringing it to me. Trust me. And don't have a list of demands for this. I mean, is I know that's probably frustrating. I can imagine. I mean, you know, I think of one big part of this business, like any other business, is I I genuinely want to make my clients happy. I want them to get what they want. Sometimes that means doing things different than they would rather them happen. You know, and and. Um, Sometimes, you know, with specific clients, sometimes it means once we get a little comfortable with each other, some tough love. You know, this is, uh, you're do this is the way it's going to happen, or you can take it somewhere else type stuff. You know, you got to, you know, it, but I don't, I never want to jump, I never want to alienate anyone. But at the end of the day, you know, if I, I also have to be efficient, I have to be effective, and a lot of times that means you got to let me be the quarterback. Um, and uh, we have to have that conversation sometimes. But uh, I, if they have input, they want to show up, they want to work with their dog. I always welcome that, and if yeah. and, I'm, and I'm cool with that. Uh, I mean, like anything else, man. I, you know, if, if I were going to say that sometimes it didn't get to be a little much with some folks, I'd be lying. You know, but but for the most part, I think that most people that are into dogs are good. They, they got it. They're kindred spirits, and we get along. Yeah. You know, so that's. It's in general way that's it's a part of life. Yeah, it's a part of life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a part of life. what we deal with. But uh, but you know, I, I have. I mean, I've told some folks, hey, you can. I mean, if, if that's the way you feel about it, then by all means, come pick your dog up. I'll cut you a break. We'll stop. We'll stop the the, the uh, meter running right now. You come get your dog, and we'll be done. Yeah. You know, and I hate saying that kind of stuff to people, but I mean, at the end of the day, I have to also. You know, be fair to my family, and I pick up the phone at certain times of the day, and I return calls at certain times of the day, and if if you need to micromanage me. Um, and then, then you need to probably find somebody else that'll yeah. be better at being micromanaged. But at the same time, you know, I want you to be involved. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's a little different in that as far as that goes. So, um, not to, that kind of guy took a little bit of a negative spin. No, I, I, I think Sam asked a question with a negative. <laughs> it was a negative question, but I mean, it's, 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 it's a real, it's a real, it's a real issue because. You know, we have it happen sometimes too, where you know you've got somebody who's a pro land manager or whatever that's going to talk to Cody about how how it should be done. And everybody wants to show me a picture of their food plot. Yeah, yeah. 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 Speaking of which, <laughs> <laughs> which is totally fine. I, I welcome it. Yeah. Uh, it. It comes to the point where it makes me not like my job as much. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, I, I should have been in the banking or something. Show me pictures of money. Uh, but um, no. Uh, Let's uh let's close it out. We'll do you have a do you hear a little feedback? What is yeah, that? Yeah, I don't know what happened. Something got a bit unplugged somewhere. Yeah. Push in on your back of your mic just a second. Oh, I think mine double click there. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, that was Still getting a little something, it doesn't matter. It's Whatever. not that big a deal. It's, it's not that big a deal. Uh, um, speaking of which, I just just uh, coincidentally, I just got a text from Southern Maine or South Maine bookstore. And uh, we've got our, our copies book, our of Fox and I. Fox and I, I think. That's uh -huh. awesome. Look forward to reading it. Um, let's close it out with talking talking positive things about <laughs> dogs. And it's not just it's not just gun dogs, it's it's all dogs and how they relate to conservation. All working dogs, 
that are in the in the field of hunting. Um, I mean, there's a big array of working dogs, I and mean, there's cow dogs and all this stuff. But we're talking about conservation. You know, there's gun dogs, there's these retrievers, there's these dogs that will find game, the flushers and the pointers. But it's not just birds. I mean, I feel like the hot topic is bird dogs, and it's a little bit frustrating to me because all, it's not the oldest game in town, and it's also maybe not the coolest or the most expensive. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's the most illustrious game. It's super pop popular right now. It's if you're a hip up lender, you're a hip up lender. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And if you're if you're a, if you're a dirty old houndsman, then you're then and you got a CB antenna and a dog box, then you're you're a dick. <laughs> and I, I don't I don't like that sure. image. I, I'm a I'm a dog person. I don't, yeah. I'm a hunting dog person specifically. Yeah, I don't care about your fruit fruit dog. But if you've got a hunting dog, chances are we get along great. Yeah. And all these dogs relate to conservation. I mean, even if it's if it's trailing bears and treeing bears, that's something that humans can't do on their own. And it's extremely hard to harvest a bear in North Carolina just because of our terrain. Without them, we need them to keep the populations in check. We need them to do research. Biologists use houndsmen to treat bears for collaring purposes. I mean, all kinds of things. Sure. And then, like, we're talking about deer hunting a little bit. I mean, I wouldn't say any of us in this room are like die-hard deer hunters. We like it, and we'll do it because we like to eat them. Sure. Um, but there is a there is a game in town, the Blood Trackers Association. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if your guys' dogs do it. Both of my dogs double as blood trackers. I just I actually just taught a – so I, I brought a friend in. Um, I don't know if I linked you guys up with him, Jay, Jay Crafter. Okay. Uh, that I've been to Africa with a couple of times. It does the anti poaching mm -hmm. stuff. We actually just had a, a workshop that was game game tracking. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge part. Of it. and, you know, but it's also it's kind of a side. Yeah, it's, it's a side hustle, and it's not it's not mainstream by any means, but it's it's a useful tool. And as a if you're if you're a bird dog person, which I'm assuming most people are, because it's hit. But uh, you can you can do another service to conservation by doubling your dog as a as a blood tracker. Absolutely. If that's something you're interested in, you can probably make a little side money doing it. Because when the dude loses his big buck and he spent and this here's the thing: blood tracker dogs are never called into an easy job. If it was easy, the dude would have found it himself. They've already spent ten hours in the woods messing up the blood trail, messing everything up that you could have possibly thought of to lay it out. So that dog's coming in the hardest situation. Yeah. The hardest situation every time. It's worth money. And so when they find it, you should charge for that service. It's so the the, the, the guy that one of the guys I spent some time in Namibia with, Mike Hensman, he does big game recovery in Africa. Um, and he makes real money when he does it because those so. trophies they've already they've, they've already got, they're already invested they've yeah. got a real value they've got a price tag on them, you know and so he charges 10 percent. sometimes 10 percent of, of one of those big trophies is mm. a big old pile of cash no i mean not everybody should do anything for money motiv motivation sometimes a nice quarter or a you know maybe a backstrap or something like that would be worth it if you you know <laughs> <laughs> not as a, not as a trade just as like the person a gesture gets, yeah the person a gesture, gets, gesture. that's gesture. certainly not uh, a cat, for, yeah. sure, for but sure but definitely you know keep that in mind like your dog is a conservationist if you're if you're raising up a gun dog sam uh me emily grayson we're raising up gun dogs we're raising up conservationists they can do multiple roles and they're good at them and it isn't going to affect negatively their cross training in another role. I mean, yeah. it's just more things you can do with your dog. I wish that I was good at training dogs on how to find sheds, and that was something that I could do because I would love it. But who's got time for everything? Like, there's too many hobbies, right? Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, but yeah, so there's all these different things that dogs play roles in conservation. There's, you know, retrieval of birds and finding birds. There's, you know, tree and all the tree climbing game. There's blood trailing big game. It's, it's a lot to think about, and there's a lot of game that's been recovered and conserved because of dogs. So that's, that's one reason that I, I got, I was into dogs before I was into conservation, because I had dogs as a little kid. Yeah. Um, and I will say they probably made me more interested in conservation, but once I realized, I put that kind of connection together that, hey, having, having this squirrel dog and every time a squirrel runs in a hole in the ground, he can dig them out. You know, that's doing something. Once I put that connection together, or once I found out that a bird dog finds all my doves, 
It's like, dude, what have I been doing all this time? <laughs> what have I been doing? Yeah, kind of to get to your, your your point on that, I think bird dogs and retrievers and spaniels in particular, even though they're the hip thing now, they, they lend themselves to training. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't need, you can look, watch a video, and you can go train your retriever. Um, if you've got one plot hound and you want to be a bear hunter and you don't know anybody, you're going to have your work cut out for yep. you. And it's a cultural thing. You're going to have to, if you want, if that's what you want to do, then you need to go seek those people out and seek out real mentorship, you know, and, and get involved. I thought you just watched where the red fern grows. <laughs> it's like uh, with fly fishing, you just watch river runs through it and you're a fly fishing. And you got it. Yeah. You're, shadow you're, cast. You're, yeah, you're, 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 you're a coon. Dog. Once you've watched red fern grows, you're a coon dog man. I mean, you, you know how to do it. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's totally hard, and, and but there's all those, I mean, you mentioned several places you can go, but there's, you know, find somebody else that's into it that's in your community. Yeah, chances are there is somebody somewhere that likes the same things you do and they, they're successful with dogs. and. You know, they don't have to be a pro, but they're just good. So now that we've had, like, y'all on for two times, mm -hmm. and people have heard from you, and we talk about you all the time, uh, tell the people... We do talk about you guys all, yeah, the, all the time. Yeah, all the time. All the time. Tell the people, you know, some of your upcoming stuff, ventures that you've got going on, um, so that people who are maybe in the market for a dog or have heard our pitch on why it's great for conservation and recovering game, are now interested in getting a dog, how they can find you, things that you've got coming down that uh, might be helpful to people. There's, y'all have done, Cody was saying it earlier, y'all have done so much free stuff that I've taken advantage of. <laughs> out of blogs, uh, you I know. I told Sammy he's going to start talking I, I am, I'm, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to come to classes, group classes, whatever it may be, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to pitch in, because there's only so much free stuff that you can take before you start feeling like Oh, I feel like I owe you guys yeah. after today. Is yeah, so how can people support support you and things that y'all got going on? Take, take advantage of the free stuff. I mean, it's out there. You know, you know, these dogs bring people together, right, and, and it creates a community. That benefits us. I mean, it's going to eventually, I, I truly believe that stuff come, comes back to you. Um, a guy that I consider a mentor, even though I don't know him well, is a man named Maurice Lindley who was a protege of another man named Bill West. This is getting back into that lineage. Mm -hmm. Where actually my, hopefully my next podcast is gonna really dig a little deeper into the history of what's called the West Gibbons or West Gibbons Lindley Method or Bill West Method. Um, but Bill West had a, a quote that was, find your passion and give it away. And those guys have all been super successful and they gave a lot away along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so I, I you know, that's me, and, it, and I have, I, I would never feel right just trying to make this thing only be accessible to people that are paying me for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll always put free stuff out there. We're always going to have days where we invite people. If you want, if you're, Emily started as a client, and when I realized how passionate she was about what she was doing, she didn't pay anymore. Yeah, because she also became a, a big helper to me. And I've got another young man, Devin Blake, that's doing that with me right now. He's a really talented young trainer, and he's coming a long way. Helping out a helping lot. Helping out a lot. Yeah. And he started as a client, and he became you know, somebody that now I'm thinking of paying money to help me. Right? Mm -hmm. He's been, been getting that good. So um, but it's important to have that stuff. Uh, do you have anything specifically coming up, Emily, that you want to plug? I've got a few things. Um, no, just that I... Since this is a local podcast, I do offer lessons, especially for puppies. You know, I'm really passionate about puppies. And if you've got a puppy and you need some help with it, please come see me. I would love to help. <laughs> she's being sincere. You know? Yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to And she's really puppies. good. She's the person I trust with my puppy. The reason she's got Ember, I wanted to have a puppy. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, let Emily raise it. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm not a puppy guy. I, yeah. I love puppies. They're cute. But I'm not, that's not my I like them when they go to somebody else's house after <laughs> two hours. Oh, yeah. oh, man, I'll tell you, I'll tell you all a quick story. I, so we went to a graduation party for some friends of Steely, and I walked in with that puppy. I, it was great. So it was about Imagine four, how great it would have been if you were single, man. It was about four, <laughs> I'll tell you what, it was about four hours, and I handed her to somebody when I walked in the door. They're like, oh, my God, I did not touch that puppy again. Mm -hmm. For four hours and you know you spend every day with it and it's good it's good for the dog to meet Absolutely. new people and get touched but it was a break man it was nice <laughs> it was really nice yeah. to hand her off and it's let other people yeah uh-huh 
And so, and that's that goes back to what we talked about earlier with that. And yeah, I mean, I, it's not that I don't like puppies. I'm just busy. And I got a lot of dogs to yeah, put my hands sure. on, and so I do. I prefer if I can farm out that socialization process, and because it's hard to mess it up. As long as you ain't hurting the puppy, oh, yeah. they're going to benefit from all the stuff you can do in the world. So I do. I enjoy having other people take that time, send them back on time for the real work's coming. Um, to just to speak to get back to the kind of things we got coming up. We're, we talked about it last time. I, I want to move in coaching and helping people. It certainly helps get into Emily's point that if you're local, so if you're listening to Three Rivers, we know the reason we're supporting you guys is because that, that certainly visits us back and it helps. I can, I, I can certainly help more people if they can get to me. Um, it, I've, I, we're taking some time. We're going to start a subscription service for people that uh, that are, are benefiting from the podcast and the other information we have, and we're going to go really deep with the, with that. So there is going to be like a monthly fee on something like that, okay. and, then, and we'll start with a tiered deal. So some of it will be, hey, we're going to maybe with each podcast, we're going to create a video that demonstrates what we're talking nice. about, and, and that'll be a, a little bit of a paid service. And then beyond that, maybe some one-on-one -on -one support or some more intense group support. Um, but I'm going to take finally. For the first time in six years, I'm not going to take any dogs for the month of August. Uh, and I'm going to take and that did that with the idea that we're going to really build this thing out. We're going to hit the fall um, kind of with the, on our feet, rolling, and, and, and understand how we can kind of transition into a little more of like a community-based thing. I still want to take dogs. I still want to train people's dogs. But I'm also uh, you know, rapidly reaching beyond middle age. And, and I'm starting to start looking for that kind of how how is this going to slow down when the time comes, and, and this is how I would like to see that happen. Uh, but speaking of the month of August, uh, I I'm also really excited to get out and kind of in, involve myself recreationally in the Three Rivers kind of area of operations more, and so I've got my paddle plans. Okay. And. This is going to get, I'm rolling right in. This is, um, this is my attempt. I have never put a, a commercial on my podcast, so I'm going to work on this. I was, uh, I've got a native Ultimate 12 I've had for a, a handful of years, and I really want to go out and do like an overnighter and do a couple of day trips. And so I've been thinking about it, and I've brainstormed over the weekend, um, like where am I going to, like where am I going to put in, what kind of access points do I, I don't want to just do the normal stuff. I've got a few pieces of water that I'd really like to check out that aren't really easy to access. Okay. And so I'm like, where would I find this information? I was like thinking back, I get on YouTube and I'm like searching people. And I remembered you guys did a podcast episode with uh, Shane from mm -hmm. Looking Around. So I actually found him online, answered a lot of the questions I had. That's Let's Shane, see. that's Shane from Rock Outdoors. And, that's right. Right. and so then this is, it's going to get even weirder. Okay. Or it's going to get weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so I, I thought about messaging them because I, I had like just like you do once you kind of scratch the surface on one thing, then it's like okay, I got I've got a few more questions. So I happened to be this weekend down at High Rock at my at my in law's new place on Abbott's Creek. Um, we had a great weekend, celebrate the fourth. I went back, came home, worked yesterday morning. Family's still out there, so I went back to visit them. Finish that up, and on my way back, I'm like, I'm gonna stick my head in the rock. I didn't know Shane was even associated with it. Oh, okay. Right? Stick my head in the rock, because uh, I'd never been in there, and I was thinking about like, looking at some trolling motors or whatever else, and there's I, there's Shane that I'd just seen for the first time <laughs> on YouTube. that morning on YouTube, and I was like, hey, hey, and I was like, are you the guy on YouTube? You know? <laughs> All the questions that I had, he answered for, he took his time. Right there in the middle of his lunch, he stopped eating, and he answered every question I had, I've got plans set. It was it was legit, man. So me and the dogs are gonna be. That's the kind of service you get over there. That's what they do. It's good, man. That was, good. That was a good commercial, dude. I can't do. I can't, can't do, top I that. Couldn't top that. Also, man. while I'm um, while I'm on the topic of you know things that y'all got coming up and reaching out to y'all, I'm extremely fortunate to work here because I'm out in the woods a lot and I can socialize my dog in a way that I think is great. But I understand. I've been thinking about this a lot about somebody with a standard eight to five job and you know I've crate trained my dog but you know maybe you can run home for lunch and then at the end of the day you're tired and you can't run out to the back 40 and take the dog out or take it to some public land somewhere 
that that phase is critical. So if you are in that position, you want a dog, but you're just worried ethically or morally about I'm not going to be able to provide a good life for this dog or socialize it properly. That's where Emily, like she was talking about, about taking that puppy and build, building a dog that can learn and can learn to learn by going to her. And then, so that's, I mean, if you're in that position, there's a lot of resources out there that can help you socialize that dog so that you can have a dog that's ready to learn and will be socialized and you can you can contract that help out. Uh, and I think that's extremely valuable because I think that holds a lot of people back from taking that leap is just worry about providing a good life for that dog and socializing it properly. So that's help you can get. Then you get past that puppy phase, you get you know you get later on and you don't necessarily have the time to train it. You've got somebody like Grayson who can come in and specializes in older dogs and can can introduce those skills that you want. Uh, there's no shame. Everybody's got a job. Every, this just happens to be theirs. Ours is, you know, the conservation stuff that we do. Mine's not dog training. It's not a full-time job. There's no shame in letting somebody who's a professional do it. I'm getting somebody to come do some drywall in my house. There's no shame in it. They can do it. They can do it. They can do it so much better than me. I've, I've tried it. I like. Look, there's no shame in it. There's no shame in having somebody help you with your dog either. And um, that's why these folks are here and they're great at what they do. And so. it can really change your dog's life and your life because of that. Yeah. Oh, so many of our clients say, I wish I would have done this sooner. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's a, I mean, it's, it's a good deal all around and you're making friends with somebody who's going to be a lifelong resource to you and Emily and, and Grayson. So, um, yeah, I just highly recommend them as, as friends beyond just like sponsor the podcast and everything. We just, we hang out. So yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's totally true. It's not just like we're trying to give a pitch or anything. It's, it's just good people. Uh, I'm going to call Grayson with questions and, and Emily with questions and hope they feel like they can do the same with me. But you know, when it comes to dogs, yeah, well, I mean, but that's what we do. So it's uh, it's great to have those those resources local, and uh, you know, even if you're not local, it's not like you can't pick up the phone and call them. So there is that. Tell everybody the best ways to get in touch with you guys, um, if you want to. Yeah, you can find me any on all social media at Short Hairs and Shotguns. So on Facebook, Instagram, and then you can always email me, shorthairsandshotguns at gmail.com. And uh, I'm, I'm at losthighwaykennels.com. Um, I've got all the uh, obligatory social media as well. Um, I, I respond better. To phone calls. You're probably not going to get me the first time around, but I do sit down and I try to get to my voicemails in as timely a manner as possible. It's tough, man. I work out outside. We don't have any service in our area, and uh, I'm not nearly as good at sitting down at a keyboard. There's just very little time for that. So if you call me, I'll, I'll get to your voicemail. I'll try to get back to you within a day or two. And you can find our podcast on Spotify and iTunes and where else? Mm -hmm. I think all the um, whatever yeah, the plug, yeah. I, I pushed all the buttons are. when I did it. So, yep. <laughs> yep. If you got the companion gun dog podcast, the companion gun dog podcast, it's worth a it's worth a listen. I listen every single one. Whether you're a yeah, whether you're a experienced trainer, dog owner, or new to the game with a puppy, or you're thinking about getting into the game, I think you get something out of it. it oh it's my just, gosh, it's just stuff that stuff I didn't ever think about. I mean, there's a lot of things that I just didn't. Pay attention to before. Well, it's like, I mean, it's like you were talking about where you have these podcasts where it's it's not it's not BS. There are a lot of chat, a lot of chit chat. It's fun, but it is a learning experience. You're talking about like history podcasts and probably listen to like hardcore history. Uh, and stuff. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh my god, love it. I would say that y'all have a hardcore history esque podcast in that it's you're talking about behaviorists. You're talking about trainers in the past you're talking about def you're defining terms and it's it's you know you think dog training is man it's a world when and i didn't know the world until i started listening to it and then man is it overwhelming and y'all do a great job of breaking it down and defining these terms and you think you know a term you think you know positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement and what those you have no idea what that means you don't <laughs> You have no idea what that means. <laughs> Go listen to their podcast and learn something because you, you think you have an idea of the definitions of these terms and you don't. You're like you and you go and talk to somebody who's an actual dog trainer and you're saying, Oh yeah, you know, 
pot some positive reinforcement, you're probably using the wrong term, <laughs> you know. So it's just it's very educational. <laughs> Stimulation didn't mean what you thought it did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, I don't even know. I got stimulated. <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, that's true. It's it's good. So yeah, check these guys out. We're always super stoked to have them on and and to be willing to take the time out of a busy dog training month and come during the heat of the day and, and hang out with us for a little bit. So we appreciate it. We've kept you um, hour 45. So if you got anything we didn't ask you that you want to say, now's a good time for that. <laughs> we don't, I think we ran really long. Maybe we'll, maybe another year from now we'll come back try again. Yes, we'll that. do it again 100%. And I'm going to stop freeloading. And when we get done, I'm going to talk about things Cut, that I can Cutting do. you guys a check. Yeah, I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to think about things that I can do with Sally and ask these folks for help. Because again, I, I need help. I'm new to it, and they're they're great resources. So we're going to come up with a plan for Sally, and uh, I'll give updates on that as we as I work with these two. So that's it. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah, that was great. So go get yourself a dog or be a real conservationist. <laughs>